is uh, you guys are going to be uh, energy market participants is effectively the idea of just thinking through how you play in an energy market, an electricity market, where there's a carbon market, renewables market, the sorts of things that we have, say, in California and many other jurisdictions, such as in Europe and other parts of the United States and other parts of the world as well. So um, what, I, what, what, would, what I thought we'd go through is to effectively talk to you first about introducing what is a wholesale electricity market. Um, and um, the idea here is really to give you the foundation uh, for uh, the energy market game that you could be playing for uh, the rest of the week. Um, the, the other thing that we that talk about is then the next step would be just what about the technology of electricity generation? How do you think about that as a player in this game, uh, as a market participant? The, uh, the next is how do you think about bidding in this game? Then we'll talk about uh, carbon pricing and talk about the two approaches that get used, which is carbon tax, cap and trade. And because what you're going to do in the game is you're going to play a game where there's a carbon tax as well as a game where there is a cap and trade market. So I think it's important uh, to understand the distinction between the two. And then finally, this game's also going to have renewable energy. And renewable energy interacts with carbon markets. And that's the other thing we'll talk about is how do these two uh, uh, sort of environmental policies both complement as well as uh, interact with, with one another. And that's, that's basically it. And then you'll, Mark will take you into the details of how we actually play the game. All right. So essentially, the way to think about a thermal generator is you take some sort of input fuel, you convert the heat into electricity. That uh, typically can either be through combusting it in the turbine, through a combustion turbine, through combusting it in a, in, in to, to, to heat a boiler. The boiler produces steam, steam turns the uh, turbine. Um, but in the way we typically summarize that for generation units is what's called a heat rate. And what the heat rate tells you is, it says, how many units of heat do I need to put in to get one megawatt hour of energy out the other end? Now, uh, the heat rate can vary, consider, it can vary for a generation unit. It, you know, think very much like how you drive your car when you're driving your car at a low speed versus at sort of a cruising speed. Your miles per gallon differ very, uh, uh, can vary significantly, similarly with heat rate. But for the purpose of the game, and for most cases, the way that the units get run, you typically think of there's sort of a single heat rate or average heat rate for the generation unit. Then what you do for, with that heat rate and why that is so important to you as a participant in a market is your job then is to procure the input fuel and then you say, okay, if for what price am I paying for the input fuel, uh, what's my heat rate, multiply both those two guys together, making sure your units are correct and you get the variable fuel cost of your generation unit. So, you know, take the example of, you know, like a, a combined cycle natural gas fired unit. Uh, this typically has a heat rate probably in the range of maybe, you know, six to eight million BTUs per megawatt hour. You purchase, say, uh, a uh, natural gas, suppose you buy the natural gas for $5 per million BTU. Currently, probably that's a little high, let's say $4. So, uh, $4, and then we take the say $7, you get $28 as your variable fuel cost. That says for each megawatt hour you produce, it's going to cost you $28 in fuel uh, to, to effectively produce it. Uh, and so that gives you your first component of your marginal cost. Typically there are other costs associated with the generation unit that, that do vary with the volume of production that you have. Uh, typically things like, you know, you, you may have to keep uh, uh, an individual on site, or you may have to do other kinds of things. These typically get embodied in a what's called variable O and M cost, so variable operating maintenance costs. So those typically run in the in the range of probably two to four dollars per megawatt hour, uh, depending on the technology of the plant. Then the the other part of the story is is essentially the fact that these uh, plants they produce carbon, uh, and uh, essentially. The simple way to think about it is, is that you know, once you control for the fuel that's burned in the unit, the higher the heat rate, 
the more carbon that gets emitted per megawatt hour you produce, right? Because you need to put in more heat energy to produce more uh, uh, the same megawatt hour. Now, across technologies, it's different because chemistry gets into it. So, for example, uh, it w typically, if you burn natural gas uh, for the same heat rate of the generation unit, you're going to get significantly less uh, uh, greenhouse gases uh, from the combustion of natural gas versus uh, the combustion of, say, coal or oil uh, to, to, to a lesser extent. Uh, and that's largely because the chemistry of how combustion takes place. But you basically you're going to get you're going to get a you're going to get a heat rate. And just to give you examples, say a typical natural gas unit probably has emits probably about uh, 0.25 tons to you know probably a half a ton uh, per uh, megawatt hour of energy that gets produced. The typical coal unit produces probably about 0.75 to one ton of CO2 per megawatt hour. So that would be your emissions rate. Okay, and then this gives you your third component of the variable cost of your generation unit uh, in a market in which carbon is priced. You simply, again, do the same thing. It works once, it'll work again. You take the emissions rate, multiply by the price of carbon, and that gives you the carbon cost per megawatt hour. And, you know, as you can see, uh, you know, it, it doesn't take a whole lot uh, in terms of a price of carbon for, the, for essentially these environmental costs to contribute a significant fraction of the variable cost. And moreover, given how cheap uh, fossil fuels are these days, uh, it, you know, it, it's going to take a pretty large price of carbon uh, to, to, to have an impact in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the electricity sector, as we'll show uh, in a few minutes. Fortunately, in the game, we don't have to worry about bankrupting the California economy, so we can set very high prices of carbon for you guys uh, to effectively change the dispatch order uh, to, to, uh, to reduce emissions from the, from the electricity sector, but uh, the real world is, is a bit more challenging. Okay, so how does an electricity market actually operate? Well, it, it, it pretty much operates the classical way you might want to think about uh, you learned in the markets work in economics one. Uh, what happens is, is each supplier effectively submits their willingness to supply. So what they do typically in a market is they'll say, okay, I'm willing to supply this much energy at most from my unit at this price. So in other words, I submit a price and a quantity pair for each generation unit that I own. And that quantity that I submit can't be more than the capacity of the unit. Uh, but, but basically, what I'm saying is that if the market price is above uh, the, the level of my offer price, then I am willing to operate my unit. If the offer market price is below my offer price, then I don't want to offer and I won't be called upon to offer. Then what happens is, is that the market operator, he takes each one of those price quantity pairs that you submit for your unit, he aggregates them up from the lowest offer price to the highest offer price to construct a basically step function uh, offer curve for you. Then he takes everybody's offer curves and he aggregates those up. So you basically get the step function that is the sum of the offer curves of all market participants. Right? Then once you get that, the market clearing price is just like you would think of it as you take the aggregate supply curve, you cross it with the aggregate demand that occurs in the market, and that sets the market clearing price. And then the way it works is that if, if your offer price is at or below the market clearing price, you're on. If your offer price is at or above the market clearing price, you, uh, uh, excuse me, above the market clearing price, you're off. Okay, that's the, that's the basic way that we, that we set prices. So, you know, this just gives a, a, an example of that um, and, and of, of what, the, what an offer curve might look like. Oh, sorry, uh, animation I didn't notice. So what happens is, is that we have demand. Where demand crosses the supply curve, that sets the market clearing price. Pr pr pretty simple. Okay. Um, so, and, mo and then the other thing is, is in most markets, they typically have a offer cap. So in the case of the game, there is a maximum offer price that you can submit. Uh, and in the game, it's going to be $500 per megawatt hour. 
Uh, in the real world, there are also offer caps. Typically, uh, what this prevents is the fact that you'll learn all about this in the game, is it, it prevents the million dollar bid, which uh, there can be times in the electricity market must be accepted, and it must be accepted because if you don't accept that bid, uh, the demand may not equal supply, and, and the lights go out when that's true. So there are regulatory safeguards in place. One such regulatory safeguard in, in the real world are offer, offer caps, meaning the maximum offer price that you as a supplier can submit. Okay, so how do you think about bidding in this market? Well, you might have remembered that, um, that from introductory economics that price equals marginal cost. Well, you probably want to forget that. Um, largely because you would be a fool ever to bid your marginal cost unless one thing is true. If you don't think that your actions can influence the market price, okay, yes, you should bid your marginal cost. But if you think your actions can influence the market price, and we'll talk more about what, what we mean by that. In other words, if you think the price that you offer in can impact the market price, then you are not going to make near as much money by bidding in your marginal cost as you would if you behaved strategically. So let's first go through the logic of why if I don't think I can influence the market clearing price, it is expected profit maximizing for me to bid my marginal cost for my unit. What I did here, as you can see, is I just wrote up a simple, your profits are the price minus your marginal cost C times the quantity you sell. So if we go through the logic and we say, okay, suppose that I submit an offer price that is equal to my marginal cost. What happens? Well, if the price is above my marginal cost, I run and I earn that profit P minus C times Q. In other words, that's pretty much the maximum profit I can get, right? If, particularly if Q is my total capacity, as it is in the game that you're gonna play, we just let you submit offer prices. We don't let you submit offer quantities. Uh, it, it just makes it easier for you. Uh, and so what happens? Well, uh, in this case, if I submit, now let's go through the other side of the, of the story, which says that suppose that the market price is below my marginal cost. Then if I bid my marginal cost, I don't operate. And I'm glad I don't operate, right? Because if I, if I operate at a price that's below my marginal cost, right, I'm losing money on each unit I sell. And there's no amount of volume I can sell that's going to allow me to make it up, okay? So now let's think through, of, okay, I, I can see that that sort of works. What about if I submit an offer price that's above my marginal cost? What happens to my expected profits? Well, if we go through it, you can see that there's going to be a set of circumstances where I don't run, right, because my offer price is above my marginal cost, right? And, and I could have earned profits. So I wouldn't want to do that, right? I, I, if, if, if there will be times that if I bid above my offer price, I'll be left out of the market when there were profit opportunities available to me. So it, and you can go through the same logic for bidding below my marginal costs. Yeah, I'll run more often, right? But there will be times that I'm called upon to run where I'm going to lose money. So if I think that nothing I do influences the price that I pay, my optimal strategy is to bid my offer price equal to my marginal cost. Everybody see that? Yeah. Is there a typo on the slide where if the supplier believes its offer price does not impact market clearing price, and then the next bullet is if supplier believes that offer price can influence market clearing price, like should that does be a uh, if I say if the supplier believes that offer price can influence market clearing price, then the supplier has an incentive to submit P offer greater than C. Right. So and that, so the above text is where, where, where? if the supplier it. believes its offer price does not impact market clearing price, right? Yeah, yeah. It was implicit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good. Very good. I fixed it on the fly. Okay. So, so why is it the case 
that if I don't, if I think I can influence the market price, what I should do is bid high. What happens when I bid high? I submit a higher offer price. That's a question. So we're going to start getting into the question phase here. But uh, I'm going to use a bunch of Mark's times too. So, <laughs> so what, what's happened? So if I think my offer price, so how does the offer price, how does the market clearing price get set? The market clearing price gets set, right, as you can see, where supply intersects demand. And if I'm the guy that's on this step, right, and I submit a higher offer price, what happens? The market clearing price goes up. I sell a little bit less, but I may, but depending on the slope of that demand curve, I may make more money from doing it, right? Because I push up the price that I earn for all of my units, okay? So what limits my, if you like, incentive to bid above my marginal cost? Exactly. Except the thing about this diagram is, is what's relevant is to me in bidding in a market is not only the demand slope, but the willingness to supply of all my competitors. So think of it as what's left over for me in the market is the market demand less the willingness to supply of everybody else. And what I'm trying to figure out is what does their willingness to supply look like? Because if they're willing to supply it looks like this, then the demand that I'm going to be facing after I take into account their willingness to supply is pretty steep. If their willingness to supply looks like that, then I'm going to be facing something that's very flat. We as economists summarize this as very competitive market, right? Because if a whole lot of guys are willing to supply a whole lot more, this we'd say is not a very competitive market because there's not a lot of people in there trying to supply more. The unfortunate thing about electricity is it looks a lot like this a lot of the time. So we get lots of good stuff, which makes it fun for economists to study and to try to figure out how to design. Uh, so, so essentially, you know, if you're, if you're really interested in the full mathematics and everything else, uh, there's, there's a paper on my website I highly uh, recommend. So now, let's think about carbon pricing and, and how carbon pricing works. So there's sort of two approaches that are out there. One is called a carbon tax, and since we're in, in academia, we can say tax, because that's what it is. Uh, and the other is, is the cap and trade. And what cap and trade does is essentially says, we're going to set the maximum quantity, and then we're going to essentially do that through the fact that people get, that, that we allocate a certain amount of allowances, and every ton of emissions needs an allowance to offset. In other words, unless you, you can't emit unless you have an allowance. In the case of the carbon tax, we just say, tell us how much you emit, and we charge you a tax based on the amount of uh, emissions that you uh, produce. Okay? The other thing that happens in carbon markets is we can either auction these allowances or we can allocate them to market efficiency, uh, market participants. Sorry. And this is one that often sort of bedevils particularly politicians, but again, politicians are typically not the best students. That's why they become politicians. But um, so, so what happens is, is they'll sit there and say, well, you were given these allowances. And because you were given these allowances, you should just use them because you're a nice person. But what happens when I use the allowance? When I use the allowance, every time I use the allowance, I'm giving up real money if the price of allowance is, is positive, right? Because I can either sell that allowance to somebody else, or I can use that allowance to produce my electricity. So the important point is, regardless if they were allocated to me, or if they were purchased by me, they still have the same value to me, which is the price of the allowance. Does everybody buy that? OK? So all right. So, um, so, 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 this, so how does cap and trade work? This is how cap and trade works. We typically say, OK, we've got, and this is a diagram that, I, that there's one diagram that I hope you get from today. It's this. It's that we have two choices for setting the price of carbon. One is 
we explicitly set the price equal to P per bit, and we get this quantity of emissions. The other way we can do it is we can set this quantity of emissions is the total amount of ounces we're allocating, and the market is going to find the price P per bit. Now, this is pretty simple and require it, it, it has a lot of assumptions implicit in it, but the basic point is what's going to happen? Well, what's going to happen is when we set a certain amount of allowances, however they get allocated, it, again, and if we think that the market for allowances in some way, it, people can trade them uh, fairly easily, uh, what happens is, is that guys are going to always make the following choice. They're going to say, okay, I can use this allowance to essentially offset my emissions, or I can engage in abatement. I.e., I can make some investment. I can reduce my output. I can do something to reduce my emissions. And what I'm going to do if the price of allowance is bigger than my marginal cost to abating, I'm going to abate. Uh, if the price of allowance is less than my marginal cost of emitting, I'm going to buy the allowance and I'm going to use it because that's the least cost way for me to comply. And that's why, as you can see what I've drawn up here, you can think of what that curve is that looks like a demand curve that if you like, the demand for allowances is really the supply of abatement. So what is, this, what is the marginal cost of each additional unit of abatement? That is effectively the supply of, 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 of uh, uh, that creates, if you like, the demand for allowances. Okay, so think of it as what we've got here is saying, okay, if we did no abatement, here's how many emissions we would have. If we spent a little money, we had get this much more, this much more, this much more, until finally the amount of abatement gives us the total amount of emissions equal to the cap. That's what sets the price. Okay. All right. So, um, so the next step is, 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 so what's the difference between carbon pricing in a cap and trade world is the fact that in a, in a, in a, excuse me, in a carbon tax world, we have price certainty of the price of carbon. It's fit. We know what it is. In a cap and trade world, we only have certainty on the quantity. So the other thing to think about is what makes this quantity, this, this demand curve, this supply of abatement curve move? One of the big problems with the supply of abatement curve is the following. What do you, what do you, what do you think the supply of abatement curve looks like if the price of gas or oil falls in half? That's a question. Quite yeah. Well, I guess it's the minimum of not emitting it or doing an investment to, to reduce your carbon output. So if the price falls in half, if that was the minimum, then this curve would fall in half. Well, actually, what would happen is that what happens? So let's let's think through it. So suppose the price of oil falls, fossil fuels falls. What happens to people's demand for fossil fuel? What happens to greenhouse gas emissions under us? Any kind of baseline. What happens to the expense of abating? It becomes more expensive, right? Because I got way more than, than, I, than I otherwise do, right? So the curve's gonna shift out, right? So it becomes much more difficult for me to abate. Alternatively, what happens if the price of fossil fuels goes through the roof? What happens to the supply curve of abatement or the demand for emissions allowance? Just think through. Go, okay, if oil becomes really, really expensive, then everybody goes, well, I don't want to burn this oil. I'm going to go to something else. Something else is probably lower carbon. So therefore, you know, the demand for allowances drops very, very rapidly, right? So one of the big problems with the cap and trade market is this fact that greenhouse gas emissions come with burning fossil fuels and as the price of greenhouse gas emissions, another one would be is what happens to the demand for abatement, okay, if the economy suddenly booms? The economy suddenly booms, out goes that curve, right? Because basically what it's saying is the level of economic activity is much higher. It's going to be much more costly for people to abate. The price of allowances goes up. Your economy goes down the tubes. 
Okay, so that's the that's one of the challenges that, that, that but but the argument <laughs> often for cap and trade is look we have good science to tell us say how much emissions should be allowed. And so that argues, yes, then you probably should want to set that as your cap. With the case of a carbon tax, we just have the issue of we set the price of carbon and we see what happens. Now, my personal view is, is it's pretty much, we just know we need to price carbon, so let's get on with it. Uh, let's not argue about the details, but at least for the purpose of the course, we want to understand how this works. Okay, so, so the idea is, as we, we just talked about this, so the last bit is, okay, so how does carbon impact wholesale electricity markets? So this is getting to the point of how does it work when we implement a carbon price in a wholesale electricity market? So this shows you what's called the merit order between a coal-fired power plant, a gas power plant, and a gas peaker, just in terms of their variable cost of fuel and operating maintenance. Okay, so coal, cheaper than natural gas, uh, uh, not as, uh, it, both are not as cheap as this gas peak. Okay. Well, we know, I told you that for this demand level, what happens is this is the market clearing price, say. But then what happens is, and, and, and so what can we do? We can say, okay, this is what happens if we put a carbon uh, price on. Remember, we talked about the fact that the heat rate is typically, uh, excuse me, the emissions rate is typically higher for coal-fired units versus for natural gas fired units. And so what do we get? You can see that when we put in the carbon costs on the coal, for the same price of carbon, we're multiplying by, say, 0.75 or 1. There we get it, and add on top of it. For coal, excuse me, for gas, we're multiplying by 0.25 or 0.5, hence you get the smaller box on top. And then for the gas peaker, it, it's pretty high. What you can see is we've just swapped the merit order when we include the fact that we've got uh, a price of carbon. And so what's gonna happen instead, right, is that we're gonna get effectively the, the situation that now you can see that the coal baseload unit runs just a little bit less, right? Whereas before it ran at full capacity. Now what happens is the gas unit runs at full capacity, the coal unit runs less, we get less emissions. Okay, does everybody see how that works? All right. And so there's two mechanisms that give us less emissions. Mechanism number one is we're raising the price, offer price of everybody, so demand for electricity ships in. And the other one is we're switching the merit order. Okay? So both of those effects are working, or hopefully should work, if we are pricing carbon. Okay? All right, so renewable energy. So the big challenge with renewable energy is that, as we said, it, 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 you know, you can only produce it when it's available. You can only produce it where it's available. And you know, just to give you an example, uh, you know, it, it, what we typically like to talk about is this thing called the capacity factor. You'll see this in some of the documents that Mark's going to give you. The capacity factor of your typical California solar unit is probably about 16 to 18 percent. What this means is it says that take the actual annual output of the unit, take the capacity of the unit multiplied by 8760. In other words, if that unit could hypothetically run 24-7 for the entire year, that's how much energy it would produce. Well, clearly it doesn't. Clearly a solar facility doesn't. Clearly a wind facility does. And as you can, a typical rooftop solar unit, about 16 to 18% capacity factor. Typical California wind unit, probably about 25-30%. Just to give you an example, typically nuclear unit in the United States is about 92%. Okay, so nuclear, very, very reliable. Uh, and, and, but the great thing about renewable is that not only is it zero carbon, like nuclear, it's also zero marginal cost. Okay, uh, and the, so the basic idea is that it's going to run regardless of the market clearing price, because as long as the market clearing price is positive. Um, and then, so what's really now relevant is the thermal demand is now served by market demand less the amount that's supplied by everybody else, okay? And just to show you that this is the uh, uh, CDF of, uh, or excuse me, the uh, probability density function or histogram of the hourly output from solar units in California in 2014. This is for wind units. 
And the one thing you can see is this gives you the probability that you get zero aliquot from solar. So roughly uh, almost 45% of the hours you get zero. Uh, for wind, it's, it's, it's less. But the, and then this gives you the sum for wind and solar output. And just to show you that we have roughly about 82,000 82, megawatts or, uh, of, of wind and solar capacity in the grid in California. But, you know, roughly about 50% of the hours a year, we're getting about 2,000 megawatt hours. So, uh, and still, there's roughly about 3% uh, of the hours a year, we're getting nothing from renewables. So, if you want 100% renewables, be prepared to be no electricity for many hours, uh, unless you install a lot of storage. So, so basically, the point being is that you, you, we're going to have to have a lot of dispatchable demand uh, still out there. So, um, so now let's think about computing the market clearing price with renewables, just to give you an idea. So this is the way to think about it with renewables. Is what's true is we could have, when we're thinking of bidding into the market as a thermal supplier, we could face the demand with no renewable output. We could face the demand with about the medium level of, therm of renewable output, or we could face the demand with maximum amounts of thermal output. And what you can see is very different prices come about for the same supply curve for the thermal units. Okay, so you can see that price volatility is going to go up, as well as like potential, certainly uh, average prices are likely to fall, largely because what, what we're typically doing is pushing in a bunch of renewables into the market, uh, usually through support schemes such as the production tax credit, or investment tracks credit, or renewables portfolio standards, or the like. But but this 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 is what happens. Okay, so just to just to finish up on this is so as you can see, go through and think about it. Is if we up the amount of renewable production, what happens to the price of carbon? In other words, if you guys invest a whole lot in renewables, what happens to the price of carbon? It goes down. It goes down. Why? Because what's happening is, is we're displacing a lot of costly thermal generation and replacing it with zero marginal cost renewable generation. All right. And so, you know, what it says is that if you have an aggressive renewables policy, you're probably going to get a very low price of carbon. See California. See European Union emissions trading system. In both cases, what's happening is, is essentially very aggressive renewables policies are essentially pushing a lot of renewables into the system, which is reducing the demand for thermal capacity. Okay, we're done. <laughs>